It's time for the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is the voice of the working class, Rick Smith. And welcome, brothers, sisters, working class heroes. This is the Rick Smith Show. Thanks so much for being here today on the big program. Lots to get to, lots to talk about. Less than 100 days till election 2024 and and it's party time i don't know if you i don't know if you've noticed i don't know if you can feel the energy uh lots of it or at least lots of it on the democratic side republicans not eh. but you know who's really thrilled by the fact that there's now energy in this race that that's now a race that there's there's something going on um yeah the right-wing corporate controlled media yeah they're, they're thrilled uh, because evidently, evidently, they're back with a vengeance. Engagement on on news sites through the roof. Uh, you know, because understand, uh, Christmas, you know, around Christmas time, retailers, that's when they make their money. Uh, politics is is how media makes their money, especially when you got a good political horse race. And it is back and back with a vengeance because in just a week, in just a week, there is energy that the Democrats haven't had in a very, very long time. Uh, Kamala Harris raised, what was it, $200 million uh, since President Biden said that he was stepping aside. Uh, there are something like 170,000 new volunteers uh, as of as of this weekend. And they're, over the weekend held like 2,300 grassroots events. I mean, there's energy, there's people getting together. It's it's almost like Democrats are ready to win. <laughs> uh, and look, you know, the fear of Biden stepping aside, everyone thought there would be this big fight. Uh, there would be fracturing. You know, all, you know, you'd have, you know, all the people eating each other. It would be circular firing squad, which Democrats are, quite frankly, famous for. And shockingly, didn't happen. Kamala Harris was able to, to, to herd all of the crazy and and energize and look the enthusiasm that you're seeing right now is you know just like i said completely off the charts the fact that you got 170,000 new volunteers uh, those are people knocking on doors and they're going to be calling you during dinner time to say hey back our candidate uh and understand the polling has all gotten a little bit closer uh it's actually kind of a race and and everybody's looking you know with great anticipation on you know who will Kamala Harris choose as her as her number two? Now I've I've I'm in the camp of since Republicans seem to want to attack her as the DEI uh, choice, you got to think that whoever she takes is going to be a DEI guy because it's going to have to be an old white guy. <laughs> um, so so we'll see, uh, we'll see what what that running mate looks like. Uh, we'll see. Um, what they bring to the table now, there's a lot of names being thrown around. You know, Senator Mark Kelly uh, from Arizona, uh, kind of, I guess, the front runner. Uh, the governor of my state here, Josh Shapiro, his name's been thrown out there. Uh, the guy, I, I, I like you know, Tim Waltz from, from Minnesota. I also like Pete Buttigieg. Uh, evidently, he's not high on the list for some reason. Not sure why, but there are a bunch of names being thrown out there. But, you know, I think a big part of the energy... And understand, this is this is going back to how bad the Trump campaign has been. You know, they had their big party, they had their big coronation, they had their political theater event, and it was bad. I don't know anyone who thought, "Oh, that was great. I, I wish I, I'd watch it again." Uh, and and the big you know keynote coming out of it, the the, the nomination acceptance speech, boring. It's almost like the Trump campaign has, you know, stumbled a bit while you've got Harris and the Democrats gaining momentum. And and again, we'll see if they, they can continue. I think this momentum will continue, you know, for the foreseeable future, end of August sometime when, you know, I think going to continue to rise through the convention. I'm really looking forward to the convention because this is going to be where I think uh, Kamala Harris has to lay out who she is. She's going to have to make the case that, you know, I'm my own candidate. I'm going to pick up the mantle from Joe Biden and move on the path that we forged together 
Because understand, one of the one of the things, and I've had to defend this. One of the things that I I, I made my choice of saying that you know Joe Biden had to step aside is he's got great material. There was incredible stuff that you could talk about, uh, and it's going to get better. Understand, as we move towards the election, better stuff's going to keep popping up. Uh, the Fed is talking about lowering interest rates, which could cause the economy to you know, go up and people will go, oh, it's not so bad. So all of those right wing talking points are going to kind of calm down, but you got to deliver the punchline. You've got great material. You got to have the, you got to have the timing. You got to deliver the line. And sadly, as much as I love Joe Biden, he was, he was incapable of doing that. Now, Kamala Harris, on the other hand, We'll see, uh, you know, which is why the, the Trump camp seems to be reeling a little bit, especially after they after they kind of screwed up with J.D. Vance, because I don't know if you've been paying attention, but it's it's been bad over there for them. And understand, you know, that's something that you don't rebound from. You know, Trump seemed almost invincible at one point, and now it's. It's actually a race. And again, as I said, who's who's thrilled about it actually being a race? Well, that would be these big media companies. Because, you know, with Harris taking in $200 million in a week, uh, that's going to go into media buys. A lot of that's going to go into the, the Comcasts of the world's pockets. Uh, and, and like I said, it's Christmas for our media companies. Because the horse race is back, baby. Now... I'm hoping for for debates, lots of debates. Uh, Trump had offered lots of debates when it was the other old guy. Uh, I would like to see lots of debates with Kamala Harris. I would like them to continue their attack on her as being weird or not very bright and a DEI hire. I would like them to continue that. Please do more of that. And as I said last week, so when it comes to pass and she hands him his hat, so to speak, um, there'll be no excuses. But ultimately, for me, it's about the vision of where we want this country to go. And I'm hoping that Harris doesn't get into the name calling and the and the the argumentative stuff, but says, look, you know, this is the direction we were on. We were investing in infrastructure. We're rebuilding our manufacturing base. We're making America great, just not not with a red hat. We're reinvesting in communities that used to be, and we're going to make them someplace to be. We're going to make this the, the future of this country bright. That's the message. And she's got great material. And this is where, you know, getting out and telling that story over and over again so people know. And oh, by the way, pointing out Project 2025 and how bad it is. Pointing out that they want to remake this country in an image that I don't think working people would be very happy with. So I'm thrilled that the energy's back. I'm thrilled that things are moving in a positive direction. I'm thrilled. Uh, I'm thrilled that that there's a chance that we can save democracy. There's a chance that we can build this country back better. Want to hear your thoughts? Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Going to take a quick break. When we come back, Sarah Burris from Raw Story is going to be here to share some thoughts on... Some story about a couch? Maybe you've heard of it. Back after this. We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. 
We are AFGE, the American Federation of Government Employees. We represent 700,000 federal and D.C. government workers who are the vital threads of the fabric of American life. We support our nation's military. We take care of our nation's veterans. We protect our nation's borders. We respond to our nation's crises and natural disasters. We provide services to our nation's seniors. The American Federation of Government Employees. We work for America. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. You know, as I said, what a, what a difference a week makes. Wow. I mean, Democrats all energized and lining the campaign coffers and Trump just losing his mind. Uh, and, and look, you know, it's, it's, it's trickling down. Uh, a guy in my neighborhood has, for the last, uh, the last three years, you know, all during the first three years of the, the Biden administration, uh, a blank Biden flag flying from the poll. Just a couple couple months ago, put up a, a Trump 2024 flag. Uh, flag's gone. <laughs> Don't know where flag went. Uh, and the Biden flag didn't go back up. I'm waiting to see if something else pops up. I kind of want to go knock on the door. But, you know, uh, kind of worried about getting shot for ringing the doorbell. You never know. Uh, but things are, are getting interesting, heating up. Uh, and here to share some thoughts on just how interesting they've gotten. I've asked our good friend, the childless cat lady. <laughs> okay, that's not in the right. Uh, Sarah Burris is a reporter over at Raw Story. RawStory.com, the website. Sarah, thanks for taking time for us. Childless cat lady here reporting for duty. Isn't that the dumbest thing someone's ever said? <laughs> it's the most awesome thing ever. Like, there is nothing I love more in the world than being childless and a cat lady <laughs> and it's not even my cat like that's the thing is that it's my <laughs> my cat um and i but i am so totally happy not being married to my boyfriend and having him live in a separate location and i am and <laughs> everything is is fantastic <laughs> there you go living the dream so to speak but what a week it has been i mean the memes uh the commentary oh, around trump's vp pick uh you know jd uh or or I got to tell you, one of my favorite nicknames that came out, Vladimir Futon. I, I just, I, I could not stop laughing uh, when I saw that. But, you know, between the, the stuff he's actually written and the stuff he's actually said and what's being made up, we're kind of you know, watching a, a dangerous nonstop SNL skit. Well, that's the thing, right, is this Vladimir Futon comes from this idea that, you know, not only did he have sexual relations with the sofa, but he also really opposes Ukraine funding. And so it just, that is is beautiful. Everything else, like the other dad jokes that I have spent the week embracing with every fiber of my being, I did not have sectional relations with that couch. Um, don't even get me started on the love seat euphemisms. <laughs> uh, uh, there were lots of sectional 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 sofa. yeah yeah because uh, yeah. I, I said it's last sectional. week you know he's he needs a little sectional healing yeah sectional healing there it's really hard to say that too and not say yeah yeah what you what you want to but like i mean this dude these are conspiracy theories that are so silly and um and for him you know it's the thrill of the chase um Couches Sorry, can't run that fast. In fact, his favorite football player, Tim Couch, he didn't run that very that fast with the Browns either. Exactly, exactly. So th these are all conspiracy theories, and they're so silly. But if you remember Sarah Palin's comment, I can see Russia from my house, That she never said that. No, it no. was something that Tina Fey said on SNL, and it, it became something so serious that she did did say it in in the the political lexicon people think that she actually did say it and so i wonder if that's how this couch thing is going to turn out because i mean it, it is it has surpassed the internet because oh, yeah. i'm getting people who are not on twitter who are you know random family members who are going like have you heard about this couch thing well look you know teenage boys you know uh, <laughs> appalachia right? you know, look uh, you know uh, I don't know. I, I shouldn't. I shouldn't say it. You know, it's, it's like the old joke. I was so poor. It was a good thing I was born a boy. At least I had something to play with. So, you know, that that kind of thing. Uh, but but here's the thing, uh, you know, 
the the Sarah Palin thing was based on some bit of reality because she was right. asked about foreign policy and she said, you know, Russia's in our backyard, meaning that they're they're not too far away from Alaska. And, you know, the, well, she said the, you can see parts of Russia from Alaska, which is absolutely true. I mean, it's it's out there. Yeah. You know? but Just not from her. Because look, I drove, her, oh, look, I, I drove by her, her house uh, when I was in Wasilla. I drove by her house. I was looking for Russia. It was not there. Not there. Never going to be there. Um, but, you know, Russia would be really accommodating for J.D. Vance if he ever needs to flee the country. Yeah. So Now, the, the one that, you know, the one that I liked, again, I can see Appalachia from my porch, which is a Sarah Palin kind of ripoff, is actually, again, couched in, in a little bit of reality because his book supposedly took place in Appalachia. But Middletown, Ohio is nowhere near where we define Appalachia. And the idea that, um, you know, he was this poor white guy with a drug addicted mother. His mother was a nurse. And so she became addicted to prescription drugs. They were making a very good amount of money um, whenever he, uh, whenever he, he was, his mother was a single mother, like more than um, a lot of more families my mother make made. with, yeah, with two parent. And then when he went to, live with his grandparents, his grandparents were making an exceptional amount of money too. So he really didn't grow up as this, you know, poor kid. Um, I, I get, you know, being what it's like being addicted to um, having a family member who's addicted to drugs. I think it's really, really important. The problem is, is that that relating to that has not led him to do anything even remotely helpful on the issue. So it's like, well, then why even talk about it? Um, no, look, and, and the military service thing like that one blows my mind is it's like, you know, everybody's talking about he's a Marine. No, he was a reporter on the ground and he was and, and was doing interviews for PR purposes for the Marines. That was his Marine status in combat. He never actually fought anything. Yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to say anything about anyone's service. Like he was he was in this he was in the service. That, fine. You know, I'm, I'm OK with that. That's a whole nother. I don't even care about that. Um, it's it's the the policy stuff that's really bothering me, and especially all the stuff we're seeing that he actually said and actually has written. Uh, I mean, you could jump into the you know the not so far into the past way back machine, uh, where you know JD or whatever his name is uh, texted a friend about Trump saying he's he's just a bad man, morally reprehensible human being. That to me is kind of kind of makes me wonder. Did Donald Trump even vet this guy? Was there any vetting process to go, let's see how crazy how crazy this guy is? Well, the vetting process was basically Tucker Carlson and and Don Jr. wanted him, right? The the lame old um um white guy bro uh crowd. Those are the guys who basically said it has to be him, it has to be him. And uh and and I think Trump just bought into it and was like, yeah, all right, fine. Um, and now it it seems like from just the articles and the the people from Trump world who are coming out as, you know, unnamed sources are all saying he's having buyer's remorse. And I think he thought, you know, I've been shot at. I've got this thing tied up. And I don't remember, like, you remember we, we were talking after he, he got shot and I was like, it's not going to move the polls. It's really not going to move the polls. People are in yeah. where they are. There is a very, very small percentage of people who are a movable vote. And this is not going to be something that I think moves them um, because he wasn't shot, you know, in like the chest or the arm or something where. So we're going really, to go degrees of shot. Uh, you know, unlike, I just unlike the think... fact that he just shot himself in the foot with J.D. Vance. I think this will move the polls. Yeah, I think uh, I think the J.D. Vance thing, I think folks in those areas of the country see him for what he is because they're just like, you know, my good old boys don't talk like that. You know, I, I know a lot of folks from Kentucky who sure as heck didn't go to Yale uh, for law school. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of, of hoity toitiness to him that that far exceeds the cultural aspect of what a legit hillbilly is yeah. right like hillbilly is basically you know a, a west virginia redneck right those are my people but 
different geography. No, and it's interesting, you know, you look at the fact that he basically sold his soul. Uh, and, and the way it looks, I don't know if you've been following this, you know, basically sold his wife's soul, too, uh, to be VP. And, and I think he, quite frankly, could be the guy that you go, yeah, you, you tanked the ticket. You were the guy who, who screwed it all up. And I mean, his wife will be fine, ultimately. But the fact that they're trying to turn her into a trad wife, we talked about this before, where I was like, look, she's conservative, but she's absolutely amazing and brilliant um, with an incredible law career from the Republican side, from the conservative side. Um, she is way a way bigger deal than he will ever be. Um, and now she's basically <laughs> to turn herself into a trad wife. I'm not surprised. I'm, I'm waiting for her to like have the helmet hair. You know, like that's that's the real Get the Karen cut, the real piece of it, right? Okay. <laughs> All right, there you go. But you know, what's interesting is you know watching in just well, it's only been what a week and a half since the convention, yeah. And and Trump seems to be reeling over the fact that uh, that Harris is now going to be the the nominee. Uh, not you know, it looks like it's locked up, uh, and you know even Republicans that I know are saying you know maybe maybe we should be you know chucking our candidate for somebody else. And I mean, they should have done that a heck of a long time ago. The problem is that now, you know, they they're stuck with theirs. They already had their convention. They already had all of the people vote on it. So, I mean, at least at the very least with with Kamala Harris, you have people who voted for that ticket. You voted for her on that ticket. If they tried to remove her, like you and I talked about this last time, it was like, that is not cool because there are millions and millions of people who voted for that ticket. And I think that's the same kind of idea where if Republicans want to throw off Donald Trump, that's not going to work. Um, the J.D. Vance thing, if he wants to get rid of Vance and try somebody else, I just don't. It's not going to move like people are baked in. This election will be about enthusiasm and getting the base vote out. And if you can move that very, very small percentage of people in those swing states, yep. then good on you. But this is all going to be about getting out the vote for the it's base. It's all about up. Yeah. As I say, a handful of vote, handful of states. Uh, you know, and, and sadly, that's the 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 balance of, of the this the nation, uh, the future of this nation in the hands of a very few. And I argue and you can you can disagree with me, um, you know, the least informed least active least engaged voters are the ones that are the ones that are movable everybody else they've dug in they've got their issues they've got their their thoughts their likes their dislikes all of that it's the, those those handful that oh, look i'll think about it two weeks before the election and then i'll decide and i think with with harris she could choose somebody that could maybe move some folks just because it would they would be interesting um but with Trump, like J.D. Vance doesn't move any votes. He doesn't convince anybody. He, this is basically the Republican Party just doubling down on Trump yeah. and and just, you know, giving the base what they want. So it didn't like I do not get that pick. I don't understand what the heck they were thinking. But again, this is what happens when you have, you know, the the Don Jr. and Tucker Carlson bros making all of your candidate decisions for you. You know, and speaking about the VP, you know, everyone's looking at Kamala Harris and who's she going to choose, and you know all this stuff. And and in my mind, I I had to laugh because the Republicans cannot stop talking about you know you know you know you know she's the Kamala is the V the DEI candidate or you know, race or misogyny or or any they just can't they can't help themselves. And I and I had this weird thought that you know whoever she chooses as the uh, as her VP is going to be a DEI hire. Exactly. Like he is, she's going to the white male Midwestern store and trying to pick up a, a VP candidate, right? Like she's got to find some dude from a red state um, who would be great on the ticket. And, uh, and that is basically the DEI hire here, which you're absolutely right. It's hysterical. You know, it's one of those things that I keep saying, you know, when the whole uh, affirmative action thing went, went around and I kept telling my white friends who were afraid that they're going to be replaced because there's evidence. Maybe you've heard of it. There's a theory out there uh, that they're going to replace all the white people. And I said, you might want these affirmative action programs for if you're actually right, because uh, you if you think you're going to be the minority, why would you want to get rid of those programs? Exactly. And that's the thing that I think a lot of folks in Ivy Leagues are starting to figure out is it's like you have 
tons and tons of international students from China who are a hell of a lot smarter than Americans ever could dream of being because we don't fund our education system the way that they do. And so they're going to get those those positions because, you know, if it's purely based on test scores, sorry, white dude, you're screwed. Yeah, you didn't work hard enough. Um, but, you know, here's the thing. There's There's got to be a way. You know, I know my Republican friends. There's got to be a way to, to, to you know, to, to rig the election, so to speak, before the election ever happens. And I've I've heard some conspiracy theory. Maybe you can help me. Uh, but there's there's talking. I guess Mike Johnson's part of the Speaker of the House uh, that they just won't put every put Kamala on the on the ballots. She's not going to get out the, in all fifty states. That is the biggest crock of you know what that I have ever heard. This we had this whole battle about. Um, Ohio and and the fear of Obama, I mean, uh, uh, Biden not being able to be on the ballot because they tried to create this law that mandates that you're on the you're you're chosen by your party a lot sooner than you know what the Democratic um, convention is, and that ultimately got fixed. And so it's like they they have to nominate Kamala pretty quickly, but you know. It's, it's not a big deal. Like nobody's printing ballots today or tomorrow or the right. next day. Um, all of these states, it's uh, it's basically like if you if you as the party uh, nominee are you know go through your convention and you're the person that's who goes on the ballot. This isn't you know this isn't like oh I need you to you know somehow win this this primary again. Um, and like I said, like this is, they've had all of these people vote in all of these states all over the country. Ballots have been cast for her already. Well, so, the argument is the, the ballots were cast for Joe Biden, not her. She was part of the Biden ticket. She was she was part of Biden. But, you know, I've had people make that argument. That, you know, again, splitting hairs. But, you know, you know, an interesting an interesting argument that, you know, you voted for Biden. I think you, you voted for Biden Harris because that is the, that was the ticket. And, you know, yeah. I think anybody who, who tried to, I, I, I just remember last weekend being so furious because I kept hearing rumors about Nancy Pelosi wanting an open convention. And I was just like, how dare you yeah, well, supersede the votes of all of these people who have already cast their ballots. And then she came out for the endorsement, but it was just like, man, you try to take away people's votes like that that's just the democratic party is not that kind of party they're the voters there are not going to be okay with that. i thought it would be an interesting convention since i'm going uh outside you know outside the convention you might get gassed inside possibly you might get gassed. gassed as well so uh <laughs> we will see but sarah as always great stuff i appreciate the time thanks so much my pleasure have an awesome week our good friend Sarah Burris. Make sure you check out her work over at Raw Story, rawstory.com, the website. Quick break, right back. Welcome back to the Rick Smith Show. Now, here is Rick Smith. So I had asked right after uh, President Biden stepped aside how long it was going to take uh, to start attacking Trump over his age. And uh, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg was quoted over at Politico saying, I'm pretty sure voters are worried about the age and acuity of President Trump compared to Kamala Harris. He said, how could anybody not watch the stuff he's saying, the rambling on the trail and not be a little bit concerned? And then you 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 look at the example. You know, Trump was uh, uh, was speaking at a crypto conference and he said uh, that evidently we're going to create so much electricity. We'll be his exact quote. We will be creating so much electricity that you'll be saying, please, please, president, we don't want any more electricity. We can't stand it. You'll be begging me. No more electricity, sir. We have enough. We have enough. Those that's all of that out of Trump's mouth. And you wonder. No wonder why some of my friends are going, maybe, maybe they need to be dumping their candidate. And you're to share some thoughts on, well, 
this and and the, the J.D. Vance thing. I've asked our good friend, for, former Ohio congressman and political analyst Bob Nay to come share some thoughts. Bob, thanks for taking time for us. Thank you, Rick. So it didn't take long. I mean, you know, uh, almost immediately you go after Trump's age because this was the talking point against Biden. Uh, and I had been saying all along, has anybody been paying attention to the guy who's afraid of batteries or sharks or windmills or any of that stuff? Any thoughts? Well, you know, when you had Biden and Trump, and I've said this many, many, many times, that when you looked at the two candidates, only Biden could beat Trump and only Trump could beat Biden. I've always said if you take a different candidate into the equation against each any either of them, it would have made a different type of campaign. Now, I really do believe had Biden stepped out in January and he was replaced and the dynamics that would unfold in February may have put Trump in a position that by June he may not have been there. Uh, and I've always said that because you've got different candidates, different you know, equations, different issues. Now, obviously, that's not going to happen now. But the question is, and the Democrats, uh, led by Chuck Schumer, pretty smart, uh, Trump, you should dump J.D. Vance is what's being said. But the first issue out there was Biden was old. Trump was old, you know, seniors, let's be nice. But Biden was much older because he, you know, just didn't move around as well. And we know, we all know the story. That's why he's he's not there now. So at the time, Trump looked pretty darn good in in the sense of mobility, and uh, and age. Biden looked older. Period. So now, that switched because you've got a 59 turning 60 years old candidate. So that makes a difference. And yeah. if the Democrats are smart. They'll be able to play the age deal. Now, he's picked a young VP, which in normal times, having a young VP, VP 39 years old is good. The problem with, with the Trump campaign, they know, had they thought that Harris was going to step in, because everybody thought either Biden was going to stay or it wouldn't be Harris, because her numbers, her numbers were horribly were horribly low. Now, he picks J.D. Vance. Uh but that young age of Vance, quote, air quotes, that will help Trump will not be as helpful to Trump because J.D. Vance has become an issue. Schumer's <laughs> out there saying, you know, Trump, you ought to get rid of Vance. They can't get rid of Vance. No, they, they can't. can't. They're married. They can't. You made that bad choice. Uh, no, and look, you're right. They, they picked a younger guy to go up against the younger uh, Kamala Harris uh, and thought that that would be a good matchup. And now they're going to have to go, you know, J.D. Vance is going to have to go up against somebody uh, in a debate that is going to be a little more seasoned. And I I think the inside track, and maybe I, I want to get your thoughts on it. While I like, you know, Tim Walls from, from Minnesota, I think I think Mark Kelly's probably the inside track. I know a lot of people are pushing for Shapiro. Uh, you know, I, I've thrown out Buttigieg before, uh, but they're going to have to go up against the, the DEI hire uh, for VP. Well, right, and... I mean, I'm I'm looking more towards well you know uh, and and they they say Cooper but I think down south it's Coper would, would be the you know the governor uh, I think he's a choice I personally think Shapiro is a Midwest choice uh, I, I I think that would be a, a great choice Shapiro would be um, you can't have Whitmer because then you'd have two females on the ticket you know it and yeah you need and an Trump, older white guy you need a DEI hire. Yeah, or or Buttigieg. So, if Trump, if Trump had known, I think his campaign would have, well, should have, then went towards a yes, a DEI hire, went towards a, a female, uh, obviously to be the the VP choice. So, but for Harris, this is a big deal. Now Kelly wouldn't be bad. You know, he's got the military background. Gabby Gifford's uh, husband. He's from Arizona. He wouldn't be a bad choice at all. But I still think I'm leaning towards, if I was in the campaign, I would say Shapiro or or uh, Buttigieg, one of the two. Yeah, I like Buttigieg cause, just because I want to see the debate. I don't care about anything else. Uh, because, look, Pete Buttigieg goes on Fox News all the time and, and just tears them up. So yeah. for me, uh, that would be that would be the entertaining part of it because the guy's brilliant. And he's he's good on his feet. He's uh, he's quick with a one line. You know, I 
How could you not love that? I had a Democrat friend of mine who called and said, what do you think about all these? And I said, Shapiro. And he said, well, and now this is not a, a kingmaker. This is this is just a Democrat. OK, it's not a, p- a political consultant or a official of the party. I want to make that clear. So nobody takes us the wrong way. But anyway, regular Democrat. And he said, well, uh, people are saying you can not have a Jewish VP. I said, well, we had an African-American half South Asian VP. We had an African-American president. And then Buttigieg, well, could we have a, a gay VP? Well, you know what? Probably. I mean, we're starting in America to get a little bit of past that. People would make it an issue, but I think the more they make that an issue, the more it would hurt uh, the Republicans. Because, look, the, the, the senator from Tennessee starting this, she's a DEI hire, that was the wrong path to go down. Yeah. What do you want to do, do that for? You well, because because it's ingrained in them. Look, you know, Speaker Johnson came out and said, hey, how about not show our true tendencies? How about, you know, stay away from the racism and the misogyny and all of that? How about how about not? And immediately they came out and that's right where they went. Right. Exactly. So it's not a place to go. And on the other hand, I think that the Harris campaign has to be careful because at one point in time, when uh, Kamala Harris was having trouble with some staff issues when she became VP because she's got a, a, a you know a known history of some staff problems. Uh, when that was starting to happen, there was a luncheon in Georgetown with some a few prominent Democrat women who decided, and I think wrong wrongfully, that if anybody says anything about Harris, they're misogynistic racists. Well, that can be overplayed too. So the DEI on the Republicans is way out of line, yeah. and I think if the you know, you said something bad about Harris, uh, her record, your misogynistic racist, I think that can be overplayed. So both sides are going to have to be a little bit careful on uh, on where they go. Trump's going to have to be careful on where he goes uh, during the debate. Do you think? I mean, because I think Trump gets a lot of forgiveness for all the crazy stuff he says. Yeah, but now it's a it was one thing when he went after Megyn Kelly and, and uh, you know, uh, the couple of the women running and Nikki Haley, he made fun of her this year, which was terrible. But now, you know, in, in the last and only debate to go after Harris in any way, because she's a um, minority female uh, or to make fun of her South uh, Asian heritage, I think could be a real, real problem. I mean, look, some Republicans uh, unfortunately are making uh fun at uh, J.D. Vance's wife's South Asian heritage. I mean, that's disgusting. Yeah. But, but understand, that's that's the world that they're in. I mean, that's the that's the reality of the, the party, which is interesting because, you know, J.D. Vance, you know, the, the choice, uh, and I got to go back to, did Trump vet him at all? Because there's so much out there that, not great, not great for Trump, but not, not flattering and I, I know that you know he he made the uh, the apology. I know he kissed the ring. I know he he did all that stuff to become VP, uh, you know Vance. But it's still out there. The fact that you know he he said you know some you know, America's Hitler, man. I mean, how do you take that back? Well, yeah. Remember too, for people that aren't aware of JD Vance in Ohio, because I'm an Ohioan, forty five fifty years I've been involved in Ohio politics at all different levels. And there was no question in my mind that Josh Mandel, the former state um, treasurer, and a few others were nine or 10 points ahead. J.D. Vance came out of nowhere. J.D. Vance was not a political operative going to Lincoln Day dinners, the Republican dinners in Ohio. He wasn't a committee man. He wasn't an activist, et cetera. He was living in Silicon Valley and uh, somewhere, I think, near D.C., and was you know an entrepreneur with Peter Thiel and wrote Hillbilly Elegy. Uh, that's how we knew about him. So all of a sudden he decides to run. Trump jumps into Ohio. Next thing you know, Mandel and everybody are losing. All the standard people that had paid their dues for years in Ohio Republican politics were gone. And Vance wins. And he goes up against a very talented candidate, uh, uh, Ryan, Ryan, Congressman Ryan. And Tim Ryan, and he is a very talented, great guy, uh, a working person's congressman. And under any other time, Tim probably would have won that. 
Uh, Vance still polled six or seven points, I think, under Trump, but it took tons of money and Trump, et cetera, to get J.D. Vance in there. Up to June of that year, I think Marietta, Ohio, was his first parade he did or event. He wasn't working weekends, so he was an enigma. So what I'm saying is, will Republicans support J.D. Vance? Yes, but is he like Mike DeWine, Senator George Voinovich, Senator Howard Metzenbaum? No, yeah. he he wasn't here, you know? So- He's new. So what do you make of, you know, you know, my my Teamsters Union president, Sean O'Brien, went to the RNC and you know spoke glowingly of J.D. Vance as almost painted him as some kind of working class hero. Uh, a guy that doesn't work weekends, you know, all running for Senate doesn't sound well, it doesn't sound like that much of a working class hero to me. Well, he became more of a I'll say populist, which is not necessarily a bad thing. He teamed up with a couple of Democrats on a couple of issues, sort of got the, quote, populist reputation out there, but yet has this right wing background, you know. So I don't think he's been in long enough, frankly, Rick, to find out where, you know, he wants to be. And when the union president, you know, was standing up there, I I thought more along the lines of this isn't really somebody that really believes that this is the new, you know, uh, working person's uh, Republican as much as somebody when he gave his speech at the convention that was trying to thread a needle somewhere for some reason, you know, with the Republican Party, like maybe a just in case they win deal. I, I don't know. I don't think anybody would know J.D. Vance well enough to say this is the new working class guy. Now, Yes, he was starting down a populist road, but again, he hasn't been there long enough to actually do some things to become the populist uh, working candidate. Yeah. Uh, now, coming out of the convention, Trump you know, talked about unity, and uh, I don't know if you saw his, his keynote or his acceptance speech at the RNC, which was really long. And, oh, and yeah. I got to tell hour, you, hour you know, for, for a Trump speech, you know, not entertaining in any way, shape or form yeah. and not, you know, it took it took it took work to get through it. Yeah. Uh, but there was this idea that you know, we were going to go for some unity. Uh, evidently, you know, over a speech on Saturday, uh, he said uh, he wants to be nice. He uh, he says, uh, you know, he, he he's he's not nice. He uh, he 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 wants to, uh, uh, you know, how, how did he put it? He goes that he gets somebody gets angry at the incompetence. Uh, but he hasn't changed, and and he's gonna you know keep going. So that whole unity pitch seemed to be kind of of a waste of time. Well, it was for the moment, and you've got to remember, the dog is chasing the car. Biden is the car, and they're chasing it. And they think the car still has some gas and it's going to keep going, right? Yeah. So he was, you know, almost killed. Uh, That makes some type of change in everybody at some point in time. Uh, The speech was changed. His own uh, campaign did not have Biden's name one single time. He added Biden once, I think, or twice. He did that. But it was a toned down Trump. Yes, an hour and a half. I kind of wanted the old Trump back. Walls, you know, what they're going to do or whatever. Sharks. Uh, something, <laughs> because it was an hour and a half, the longest in convention in Republican history. But when I say they chased the car, he he came out of the convention the way he needed to be, which was, yeah, a nicer more toned down unity, you know, type of approach. Well, they caught the car. The car ran out of gas. The president stopped. And I don't think that anybody really thought it was going to go to the point, I didn't, that Biden was going to actually leave. I thought it would get hang in there. It'll calm down. Once Schumer and Obama and everybody kicked in that, you know, that was it. So I think the campaign did that on purpose. And as soon as Biden stepped out. I think the campaign probably sat down, had a few beverages, and the next morning uh, said, "Okay, what do we do now?" Yeah, no, I'm right there with you. You know, the the reality is, is um, you know, I I knew he was going to go because you don't you don't come back from that debate. Uh, I'm sorry, as much as I, I love Joe Biden, uh, that debate to performance, you you can't come back yeah. from that because yeah. you have now confirmed every one of those memes and every one of those beliefs by having what, you know, you know, you got to think, you know, wherever James Stockdale is, um, he's, he's happy. 
and, and I've got to give credit to uh, Kamala Harris and, and her campaign on this aspect, especially, although Biden endorsed her and that was, that was great. But I've got to give her credit because I thought this would turn into a chaotic situation. I think the Trump campaign thought it would. I did. I thought it would turn into some chaos. But Biden endorses, you know, quits at 1.46 p.m. on Sunday. Within an hour or so endorses. By 4 o'clock, she says, I'm in. Obama himself said, open convention. But then she was uncontested because within 48 hours, there were crickets. Yep. So she's in. And then everybody said, okay, it's all right now, you know. We all now support her. And so she did something that I really didn't think she could do. Now, the reason I didn't is because her polling numbers have been the worst in VP history. Now, of course, J.D. Vance has the worst numbers in VP candidate history. But she did. She had some of the worst numbers. So I thought, okay, people are going to say she can't win. There was even doubt with President Biden himself and his inner circle about her being able to win. But you know, she has a bump right now. Now, it's not done because you you still got to look at seven of the nine swing states. Trump's holding. She's got this bump. This bump's going to continue. She's going to go through the convention. She's going to get a bump. Uh, but things are going to sort out here and there. And it's going to be very strategically important how each campaign decides how they're going to do this thing. Yeah, no, September... I'm sorry, good. No, September and October are going to be really interesting on in how, how these two campaigns maneuver because it's it's a whole new ball game. The energy on the Democratic side is I, I, at an all-time high. I mean, the energy that I haven't seen since Obama's first first True. campaign run. True. And and now there's a few things. I think that the, the DEI thing has to stop now. Uh, the other thing is if, if the Trump campaign goes down the course of dummy Kamala, You know, she's dumb, blah, blah, blah. They go down that course, they're going to be hurting. I think on Harris's end, uh, Kamala Harris's end, I was, when I saw the campaign starting to talk about the prosecutor versus the felon, I thought, at least my opinion, stop it, stop it. Don't, don't go there. Just don't go there. It puts Kamala Harris in a different situation as a, quote, prosecutor, first of all and what type of prosecutor was she, and everybody knows he's a felon. So I think both campaigns were throwing the initial little things out there to see if they'd stick or not. Uh, I think they've got to get into, you know, some issues and where they want the government to be and what type of government you want. Uh, And then here's the biggest thing, too. I learned this the hard way uh, years ago. You know, she needs to define herself because she might be the VP, but there's a lot of people still don't know. Yeah, and she's in and Biden's she, shadow. So, so absolutely, she de- define herself before they define her. No, I'm I'm right there with you. And I think that will be this week. We'll see a lot of that stuff rolling itself right. out uh, in the lead up to the convention. And the, the convention, you know, clearly the coronation, uh, the big sure. celebration, the big you know political theater event, which will then I think you know we'll we'll see a, a much clearer. Uh, a much clearer picture of who she's who she is and the direction she wants to go. Mm-hmm. So yeah. we'll see what happens. Uh, but the energy is back and the media companies are thrilled. But Bob, no question about it. No question. The energy level. Hey, look, she might not be ahead in seven of the swing states or whatever. Uh, she's brought energy back to it, and there's a chance now yep. amongst everybody. Everybody thinking. Also, I have many Republican friends who in the last four or five days have, have called me up and said, I don't know about this election. Now, they weren't saying that. Yeah. The we confidence know. is shaken. Uh, and that is it's a shaken. good place to be. But, Bob, as always, great stuff. Uh, cannot you. wait to, to hear what you've got for us next. Okay. Our good friend, Bob Nay, former Ohio congressman. I uh, want to hear your thoughts. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Do you feel the energy? Are you part of it? Rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Right back. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. This day in labor history, the year was 1956. That was the day that an oil tank explosion took the lives of 19 men fighting a fire at the Shamrock Oil and Gas Company in the northeast of Dumas, Texas. Dumas was in the Texas panhandle. Oil boom country. 
The day after the tragedy, the Chicago Daily Tribune carried the story of what happened. Four huge petroleum tanks exploded today, bathing 19 men in a super hot wall of flame and killing them in their tracks. The towering orange fireball of the first explosion was sighted in Amarillo, 40 miles away. The events that triggered the explosion started when a flammable gas caught flame and flared into a small ground fire at Shamrock. Employees and volunteer firefighters tried to stop the blaze, but despite their effort, the fire grew. Just before 7 in the morning, a 12,000-barrel tank exploded. This ignited another 20,000-barrel tank, and then two more. Fifteen of those fighting the fire died instantly. Four others later succumbed to their burns. Many more were injured. A news editor on the scene described what he saw, writing, quote, A bright orange mushroom boiled up, floating in heavy black smoke, and I prayed that those firefighters would get out alive, but some didn't. Eight who died were Shamrock employees. The other 11 were volunteer firefighters. Today, a memorial bearing their names pays tribute to those who died. An inscription reads, quote, But whether on the plane so high or in the battle's van, the fittest place where man can die is where he dies for man. In 2015, 68 firefighters died while on the job protecting people and property throughout the United States. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and The Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. Welcome back to The Rick Smith Show. Check out our website, therigsmithshow.com. Questions, comments, something on your mind. Email me, rick at therigsmithshow.com. A couple emails I wanted to get to. Uh, a couple of days ago, I did a bit on uh, on you know a, a, a video that I had seen about you know someone you know, trying to cart shame people. And remembering, you know, when I was younger, that uh, I knew a guy who, you know, his 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 life basically was was pushing carts back and forth out of the parking lot. He, he was disabled. And that that job gave him a sense of pride, gave him a sense of accomplishment, and gave him the ability to make a living. And I got some really weird responses. You know, a couple of them going, well, you know, do, do you want me to not have to do my own dishes? I'm going, completely different thing. You know, shouldn't I have to, shouldn't I be able to mow my own lawn? And you go, again, completely different thing. Uh, the whole shopping cart thing is to make corporate America a little bit more money by not having a person like the person I talked about uh, to have that job. This is about cutting individuals and their ability to make a living and and really adamant about the point of, you know, should you know, should I have to pay somebody to clean my house? No, that's your that's your business. You you keep care of that. But in these spaces where we're being shamed to not use the self checkouts, look, I've gone to uh, supermarkets where. I've had people mocking me for not using the self-checkout. And I, I refuse to. Because, look, my grandmother retired from a job as a cashier um, and, and you know, earned a very good living, uh, had, you know, good benefits, had good uh, retirement, uh, all kinds of things, and retired on a pension uh, from the UFCW, local 880 in Cleveland, uh, from a job that, that was, you know, a retail store job where you know people supported families on those jobs and were able to retire with dignity and and you know I look at these jobs as cashiers once they're gone they're never coming back you know like like the job of pushing carts back once they're gone they don't they don't ever come back and the more we shame each other into saving corporate america money uh, the more that that bugs me uh, now one email came in who evidently uh, a, a, a viewer of the show for, you know, I, I would think a while because this is the point that, that I, I had hoped to make. Um, she said, look, you know, people don't take pride in their jobs today because people are treated like garbage. Uh, back in the day, they could support themselves and now they can't. Now they're not getting benefits or decent wages. They can't afford their living. Uh, they don't care about their job because it doesn't care about them. Uh, they wrote, my my great grandparents would feed a family from one person working at a grocery store, and that's unimaginable today. And, and look, that's absolutely the truth. Uh, the person I talked about who pushed the carts, that person was able to maintain their own residence, pay their own bills, you know, 
lead a dignified life. Now you may go, well, it's, it's, it's not important work. All work is important. All work should be valued. The idea that people should be able to take care of themselves, put food on the table, a roof over their head, give them some opportunity, that, that's kind of the American dream. That's the bedrock. And to have a wide array of employment for people to be able to get into so that they can have that, that pride, uh, that self-sufficiency, I think is incredibly important. So as we're, and the point was, as we're moving towards this automated robotic future that's coming where everything's online or everything's, you know, you know, done not by people, my hope was is that maybe we remember that these jobs people need, maybe even you. And as we're moving to this brave new world, what happens to working people? I'm against the idea of universal basic income. I don't think it's good because uh, I think people need, they need that, that they need that work. Just my thoughts. want to hear yours though. Email me, rick at the ricksmithshow.com. Uh, I do answer all, me, all emails eventually, personally, uh, but uh, we'll see. Uh, as always, I appreciate you being here. We'll see you back here next time. You've been listening to The Rick Smith Show. Email Rick, Email Rick. at rick at thericksmithshow.com. Until next time, this has been The Rick Smith Show, where working people come to talk.